Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to start a new chapter. This chapter is focused on accounting quality. We know that accounting information should be fair and it also should have a complete and accurate representation of the firm's economic performance. Um, and also importantly is the risk associated with that and also where the firm st uh, stand in its current financial status. So a lot of the um, gap principles is designed to be as to represent this information as accurate as possible. Another important part of accounting information is that we need to use it so that uh, to analyze um, a firm's value and to and in order to analyze a firm's value, we need to use financial information uh, to extract relevant data for us to estimate future earnings and future cash flow. So the idea of accounting quality includes both whether or not it is um, relevant and whether or not it is accurate. So uh, it's both the economic uh, information, um, particularly important is the nooks and also management's discussion and analysis. Um, management's uh, DNA is particularly important for understanding risk. So what do we mean by uh, quality? A high quality accounting um, data means that um, the information we we receive or the information portray is fair and it includes as completely as possible the economic um, impact of a firm's decisions and action. So both accuracy and also um, um, representativeness. So management may attempt to change um, a firm's accounting um, appearance and in, in some cases management in trying to present a better picture not just decrease the quality of the accounting data they may actually commit outright accounting frauds of course that would be illegal now the two main account uh, three main accounting statements are the income statement the cash flow statement as well as the balance sheet. So when we talk about quality, we also want to emphasize the quality for um, earnings as well as the financial positions. And so the earnings quality is an accounting statement concept. And so when we talk about earnings quality, we is particularly important for valuation because it helps us understand uh, and predict future performance and therefore to estimate value. Balance sheet quality is also important, particularly in terms of the risk. Um, we use data from the balance sheet to estimate liquidity, solvency, and also financial flexibility. So a lot of accounting fraud will affect both earnings quality as well as balance sheet quality. Here are some famous accounting scandal. Uh, some of these you may have heard of, some of these you may have not. So let's take a look at um, what each one of them did and also how they uh, how did it affect the earnings as well as um, balance sheet quality. So waste management, uh, what they did wrong is that they falsely increased the useful life of long-lived tangible assets. So what that will do is it will increase the asset side. Um, so it will uh, present a false sense of solvency. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it will also increase earning because it is lowering uh, the appropriate depreciation expense. So it under, understates expenses, so you increase earnings. Um, you also increase the, um, the, the value of asset, uh, but that will incor incorrectly present the um, economic value of the firm. Enron Corporation, which is an energy corporation, what they did is they use um, 
illegal tactics in um, taking liability off their books. So they underreport uh, long-term debt. And of course, that significantly affects the quality of all these uh, financial solvency ratios. Um, you also um, under underreports interest expense because this liability are now not cons not reported as part of the firm, even though the firm is still legally liable. So remember, all of these are illegal. Uh, next, we have um, WorldCom. They capitalize rather than expense expenditures. So uh, what happened then is they underreported expenses, so overstays earning, and also uh, increased asset. Um, so, uh, again, falsely present a more softened picture uh, than they really are. Uh, AIG is a healthcare um, it book debt as revenue. As you can see, that's uh, really bad because it underreports liability and overstates revenue. So it affects both the balance sheet in terms of its solvency and also overstates earnings by overstating revenue. Lehman Brothers is a financial services firm. They sold quote unquote toxic assets to other banks with a buyback agreement. So toxic assets basically means that they have very they have uh, much lower value. So they removed this asset from its books um, so that it doesn't have to show them as asset. Uh, but then they have a buyback agreement, which should be reported as a liability. So what, what will typically happen is they probably sell it for a much lower price than the buyback agreement um, specifies. So the, they actually will have cash, um, and pay relatively small cash, but then they also um, take away the liability. So it make the, the uh, balance sheet look a lot stronger than it would otherwise. SATEM is an IT and accounting service firm. Uh, they created fictitious revenue entry, so that obviously will overstate revenue, so affects earnings quality. Uh, it also uh, will increase accounts receivable, so increase current assets, so in, uh, increase the liquidity and solvency, or the appearance of liquidity and solvency. Uh, once again, I want to emphasize all of these um, um, frauds are illegal. Uh, however, there are other things that a company may do that are legal but still affects the firm's uh, accounting quality. Something that management, um, um, not all of them engage in, but is very tempting for management to engage in is earnings management. And I have done research on uh, earnings management um, and look at how does it affect um, or how, how does it affect stock performances and also what um, event may, um, may earnings management be more likely to occur. So first, what is earnings management? Uh, earnings management is management using judgment within financial reporting um, and in how they create transactions to affect the financial uh, uh, output. So, um, and again, these are not illegal. There are illegal activities they can do. There are also legal activities that they can do. Uh, so ultimately what these will do is they will mislead stockholders and stakeholders about the actual economic performance of the firm. Um, they may also try to use earnings management to influence um, particular outcome uh, that may be depending on the accounting number. So this could be uh, anything from obtaining a loan to bidding on a government contract. So once again, manage, uh, earnings management is intended to create the appearance. So the un so what really happened in earnings management is the data or the information that is presented is no longer a true representation of the underlying economic uh, performance of the firm. Detecting earnings management is very difficult. Um, 
the recent years management can exercise judgment in many ways again some of them can go all the way to committing fraud but a lot of them are choosing particular um, accounting judgment so for example uh, how to value inventory um, anywhere anywhere to um, when do you recognize revenue so booking revenue that doesn't exist obviously is in, is is uh, illegal but uh, at what point do they recognize earnings that is a lot more um, subject to interpretation in addition to earnings management, um, another very important part in um, affecting accounting quality is when to recognize and how much liability to recognize. So according to accounting principle, um, financial reporting should recognize a liability when you satisfy the following criteria. So first of all, the obligation involve some pro future um, economic ch exchange. So for example, future transfer of cash, goods or services. So those are, so for example, if you have um, committed to perform, you have received payment for services that you have not rendered, uh, you need to recognize that as a liability. And a firm, can measure with reasonable precision um, the value of uh, the uh, obligation. So you have to, so these are the requirements. So you have to uh, involve a specific um, transaction. Uh, you should be able to have, be reasonably uh, able to estimate what that value of that transaction is. Um, or the firm have the present obligation um, and they have little to no discretion to change that obligation. And then, um, or something that already happened. So for example, um, you already received cash, for ex like I was explaining earlier, uh, for services that you have not performed. Um, so in that case, that is an obligation. Uh, that is a liability as well. So some of these are very specific. For example, a firm has a present obligation, little or no discretion to afford to transfer. That is very clear cut, uh, very easy to, to identify the value as well as what the firm needs to do. Uh, others can be a lot more ambiguous. So we can actually classify um, this type of liabilities by based on the degree of um, uncertainty. So the most certain uh, obligations have fixed payment dates and amounts. So any type of formal loans, whether it's a NOOCs to a bank or public bonds, those are really easy to determine. It is definitely a liability with, with very clear defined obligations. Um, next will be, you know the amount, um, but the date is somewhat fungible. So accounts payable, once again, that typically has a specified date, but a lot of companies stretch their accounts payable a little bit. Um, and taxes payable is another, you can, you might be able to, um, to extend that. Um, and then you go all the way to um, contingent obligations. So you can see what is most certain and what is uh, the least certain. So you have a lawsuit that has not been settled. So the amount you, you, you may or may not be liable and the amount is unknown. Um, off balance sheet items um, and then loan guarantees. So loan guarantees, if the loan, the borrower fulfills his obligation, the loan guarantee will never be invoked and there has no impact on the firm. But if the borrower defaults, then the guarantor will have to fulfill his obligation. So the guarantee at that point becomes a liability. But until the borrower defaults, the guarantee itself is not, um, is a relatively small liability. So as you can see, um, 
this is the spectrum of most certain to least certain. So this type of um, liabilities are typically recognized. Um, these are typically included in NOCs, but are not recognized as liability and are not recorded as such. We're going to go over a few cases to demonstrate this. So our first case involves a transfer of receivables with recourse. So I encourage you to pause the video and it's a lot of information. So again, resume the video when you are ready. Okay, welcome back. So we're going to take a look at how do we classify this? So what are the important things that we need to consider? So first of all, when we transfer a receivable with recourse to be considered a sale, the asset, in this case, the receivables have to be isolated from the selling firm. So it has to be totally separate. And then the buying firm obtains the right free of any conditions to do with what it deem best for the buying firm with those assets. And then the selling firm does not maintain any control. So all of these are important things that we need to take into account. So in the case that we look at, the call option, the option that enables them to buy back any, um, any unpaid accounts receivable before uh, before the, the 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 day becomes a call option. So the call option limits what the buyer can do because they have uh, when something if if um, the seller in this case uh, Divini if Divini wanted to buy it back wanted to exercise that call option Condon has to sell them back so Condon cannot resell the assets so they are not free to do with it um, what they want so this cannot be considered a sale the other is the if it does not have that call option um, then the other deciding factor is the amount of risk of the uncollectible receivables. If the uncollectible receivables is relatively low, then the transaction will probably be considered a sale. If there is a very high um, chance of um, uncollectible because this is with recourse, so anything that is uncollected, um, Divinity will have to pay. So if the risk is high, then that will trigger that la the, the third condition. But in general, if it is a uh, standard operating um, process and they have very low risk, then a transferring accounts receivable with recourse will be considered a sale and not be carried on as a liability. But in this case, the call option is the most important factor and that make it not eligible as a sale. And the second case is product financing. So once again, uh, please pause the video and take a look at this problem. Okay, ready to continue? So in order for you to recognize product financing um, as a liability, these are the two things that must occur. One is the arrangement requires the sponsoring firm to purchase the inventory at a specified price. Um, and the payment made to the other entity cover all the costs. So if the arrangement has this requirement, then you must recognize the financing as a liability. Uh, in our case, Divini agrees to repurchase the inventory at a fixed, co fixed cost. Um, and they also, the formula also includes um, fixed interest rate. So because of that, Divini will have to treat this arrangement as a collateralized loan, meaning that they have to recognize it as a liability. So those are the two criteria, and in this in this in this example, it affect, um, both criteria is satisfied. Our next next case is a throughput contract. So once again, please pause the video and read this over carefully. Now throughput contracts are very interesting. 
if you look at the tra uh, the transaction, it actually has all the characteristics of a liability of a loan. Um, however, U.S. GAAP does allow this type of contract to be treated as an executory contract. And all you have to do is just disclose it in a footnote. You do not have to recognize it as a liability. Our next case is a construction partnership. Okay, pause the video, read this carefully, and highlight the important elements. Ready to proceed? Okay, so this one is actually quite complex. The two companies each own 50%, so there's no majority ownership. That means that they do not um, need to create a consolidated financial statement. So they will not bring chemicals uh, liability into um, their own financial statements. Because of that, the loan will appear on chemical um, financial statements but not on Divini or Missions. Um, the ownership will be, will be, will, will be shown, uh, but it will shown as their equity ownership. So it's the net value, um, asset minus liability, is equity value that will be um, presented in Divini's financial statements. Once again, the commitment to pay the operating and debt service costs is considered an executory contract. What that means is they have to disclose it in the footnote, but they do not have to in, uh, value it as a liability. So the only liability that the uh, um, Divini would recognize is the market value of the debt guarantee. So once again, it is not the entire that value, just the value of the guarantee. And that's actually a relatively complex valuation process because that is an option. So we have to value the debt guarantee as an option pricing or using an option pricing formula. Our next case is research and development partnership. So go ahead and pause the video and um, take a good look at this problem. So once again, our concern is whether or not we need to recognize the liability. So for research and development partnership, um, the accounting rule is that the firm has to recognize it as a liability if one or two things. One is the sponsoring firm must repay the financing regardless of the outcome of the R&D work. So that's one or the sponsoring firm, even when there is no guarantee of loan or obligation, bears the failure or the risk of failure of the R&D effort. So in our case, since they guarantee the bank loan, that satisfies the first criteria. So no matter what, ha what happened, um, it must recognize it as a liability. Now, what happened if it did not guarantee the loan. Had the arrangement been, be different and Divini did not guarantee the loan, but if it has the obligation to buy the results no matter what the outcome, then you will still have to recognize a liability. And the liability among in this case is the amount that they expect to pay for those purchases. We have one more case, and this is, again, another very common occurrence. This is hotel financing. Take a good look at this example. So in this case, um, since the only thing that Dimini did was to provide a loan guarantee, that, that is the, that's the extent of the liability that it has to recognize. Uh, in this case, since the company, since the hotel has been profitable um, the, and it uses the building itself as a collateral, um, the, the amount, the value of the guarantee is likely to be relatively small. Um, the only time, if the default occurs, um, then, you know, the first recourse from the bank will be to use up all the cash that's available in the partnership to pay off the loan. And if that failed, the bank can sell off the property to again, satisfy the loan obligation. If there's still um, remaining 
uh, outstanding uh, uh, balance, then Divini will have to recognize that. So they will have to recognize the liability for the portion of the loan that remains unpaid after the hotel has been sold, after all the cash um, in the partnership has been used up. So here's a summary of the uh, six cases that we look at um, in our particular example. Um, so the transfer of receivable, because it has an option, um, it is, has to be considered um, a, as a liability. Product financing, again, uh, it has a guarantee to buy back. So once again, it has to be um, recognized as a loan. The throughput con track is considered an executory contract so it does not have to be recognized as a loan but for the economic purpose it actually you know is a liability because it is 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 promised uh it has a promise obligation um the construction um partnership because it's a joint venture um it does not have to be recognized as a loan it's just a um a footnote, um, but economically it does have that obligation. Uh, the R&D partnership uh, it is a liability and it is recognized as a loan, so there's no difference between the economic um, impact or the economic performance versus the accounting recognition. Um, hotel financing, um, in this case, it is, relative, um, it is a transfer to a partnership. Um, once again, the loan guarantee, in this case, it has a relatively low um, value. So the economic impact is, is, is relatively immaterial. Okay. We will end this video here. We'll continue in the next video and I'll see you soon.